If you are a repeat offender, welcome. We're doing this uh, in a virtual world, virtual environment. First time for us. Please go in. Round. Awesome. Uh, no problem. You're welcome for j jumping in. So, guys, what I would encourage you guys to do is part of what we do in a physical, like I want to set the agenda of we, what we normally do. In the physical environment, we let everybody introduce themselves and give a quick, you know, five-minute, not a five-minute pitch, two-minute pitch about who they are, if they're a wholesaler, if they're a rehabber, if they're a landlord, if they're a bird dog, if they're an agent, if they're a hard money lender. And, um, and this is how we network and connect with each other because the power, well, we believe the power is in the network. And this is the first time that we're doing it in this environment. And I want to make sure that we're still living to that philosophy. So if you're a builder, say, hey, I'm a builder and I'm looking for lots in this area. If you're a rehabber, say what you're, you know, what you're rehabbing, what projects you have coming up. If you're a landlord, say I'm a landlord. Um, let people know who you are and what you're doing. What's up, guys? Hey, Jess. Josh Cohen, what's up? Brave new world, man, learning how to do this online. It feels a little weird not seeing you, your faces. We just see the comments, right? Unlike I'm Zoom. You can't even see the comments, Rob. Where are you seeing comments? Oh, you can't see the comments? No. Oh, oh well, wait I, a minute. Let me try live comments. You know oh, what? All I have to do is turn on live comments. Look okay. at me learning how to use this software. And I think what happens is, is I can add these comments to the stream as they come in. Okay, Gaithersburg. Nico's from Gaithersburg. Hey, look at that. That's fun. That's fun. Barry's living life. I love it. Okay. Right. So, by the way, the tech that we're using right now is StreamYard, and it connects to my Facebook page, my private page, it connects to uh, LinkedIn, although it didn't. It said that I didn't have approval. See, Josh Cohen, what's up? Look at that. Okay. Barry is wholesaling in Nova. Looking to focus west. Okay. So as people comment, I'm going to be making sure that I'm adding those comments to the stream. And what we want to do is have a conversation. We want to have a conversation about what we're seeing in the marketplace, what's happening in real estate right now with uh, COVID-19. And um, and this is the first time that we're doing this on StreamYard. So uh, this is fun. So Mark, let's have a conversation. This is a conversation. It feels like you and I are going to have a conversation. And people, by the way, if you have questions, ask your question. We'll show it on the screen and we'll make it interactive. This is a way that people get to know you. And by the way, this is what it's all about. It's about asking good questions. We've got a topic that we're going to be talking about, but I want to make sure that we're featuring you guys as well, right? Yep. So, um, Mark, let's talk about real estate, COVID-19. What's been going on in your world with the construction you're doing, the investments you're doing? Yeah, so obviously a, a brave new world we're living in, right? It's kind of hard to believe the last uh, grid event that we did, Rob, was that first weekend in March at Grid Connect where we had like 100 people in a room, right? That would be both illegal and ill-advised today, just four weeks later. Uh, it just, it seems really surreal, uh, the difference uh, in the world and how we're living in it. But from now, from when you know, we, we last saw some of you guys uh, at that event in, in late March. So it's been an adjustment. Uh, we were talking about working. Well, I remember, I remember Josh emailed me the night before and yeah. said, hey, is this still going on? Like, I think we might have been one of the, the last actual events, live mm -hmm. events in, in the D.C. metro area. Probably. Um, because after that, it like it came out saying this is a pandemic and it's completely shut down. That was a Saturday, and then that Sunday after it, you know, that it started to get really real uh, in parts of the country. So it's it's been an uh, interesting and weird and mostly not fun 
uh, last few weeks with what we've seen going on in the world. Uh, but we're coping and we're managing and we're moving forward, right, with things like this, with learning how to go virtual, uh, learning how to do more online. You're, we're learning a lot. I know I am. I'm learning more about what we're capable of uh, when we're not just actually going out into the world every day uh, and standing in front of people. Uh, so you're talking about construction and, and investments and how we're getting deals done uh, and how we're getting work done. Uh, we've pared back the uh, crews to where we're only one or two guys in a house at a time uh, mm -hmm. so that we can keep them separate and keep them at distance from one another. Obviously, being clean uh, is huge now. Uh, we're cleaning everything as we go, uh, especially if we're working in someone else's home. Uh, we're being very clean about that. We're fortunate that we've had a few uh, projects we've been working on that were in unoccupied houses, right? Houses that are being renovated for sale or renovated for an owner who's not there. Uh, so that's been good. Uh, we have done some remote uh, things with even our inspectors. So in Fairfax County, we do county inspections for work and the county inspectors have called the project manager who's running the job that called in the inspection on the phone by Skype and said, all right, show me this. Show me you know, this piece of plumbing. Show me this piece of electric. Get out your uh, your tester and go test an outlet. Uh, it actually walks the guys through the job uh, and tells them what to show the inspector. And we've passed inspections, you know, virtual inspections. So well, I know, yeah, I know that what we were also doing was we were getting quotes for from you guys, right? For for our investor clients by going by going through Zoom and being able to give somebody a quote for what the renovation could be so that they could purchase that asset. Because what I'm finding is that, yes, you know, we're learning how to adapt to a new reality and the market is still moving for those that are brave enough to continue to move, right? right. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we, we ratified 17 contracts in the last like 20 days or so. So we've ratified a lot of contracts. So things are still moving. I am right. seeing the appointment count go down, but I think that's more psychological and mental than anything else. And so what we've been doing from a team energy standpoint, and this might help with a lot of you. What's up, Trump? Good friend of mine just joined us. Steve Trumpet. What's up, man? Good to see you. Um, so, hey, Jay. Um what we what we've done is we've created a, an environment of energy at 8 30 in the morning through zoom to make sure that everybody is in the right headspace because it's very easy to put yourself in a negative headspace with everything that you listen to on the news so it's yeah. important if you're a small business owner if you're an owner if you're a real estate entrepreneur investor agent that you are surrounding yourself with people that are lifting you up you're creating that energy and um uh, and we're doing it in a virtual environment. And it's been, it's actually been really, uh, it's been awesome because yeah. most of our team always worked virtual anyways. And it right. was like Thomas and I and the operations team in the office, but I never saw all the engagement that the agents had. And so now we've been able to lead generate together, talk to our clients together, help people move forward together. So um, it's created, it's created a great environment for us. Culturally, it's been great. Yeah. So I've, I've, change the slide to the next slide for tools and strategies, because I think your point about optimism is a strategy. Optimism is a choice, right? Yeah. Uh, you you can choose to, to put your head in the sand or throw your hands up and say, woe is me, the world's gonna end and give up, or you can figure it out. Uh, and then the ones that will uh, thrive and not just survive will be the ones that are going to figure it out. Disruption is uh, an opportunity. Disruption creates opportunity. So we have to find opportunity. And so one of them, when we're talking about virtual stuff, um, we talk about this in investing, uh, especially when we're doing the how to do, uh, how to estimate renovations discussion, right? I don't want to go out to every single house that I'm thinking about buying and walk through it and try to figure out how much it's going to cost to fix it up. And people getting used to doing things now virtually because of this, I think is going to make that a lot easier. It's certainly going to make my life, I think, a lot easier on the contracting side because I'll be able to do virtual meetings and virtual estimates 
uh, by camera with clients for contracting, just like mm -hmm. we could for uh, making offers on houses. It's the same, the same thing. I'm not going to be able to see behind the walls anyway. So just show me the space. Give me a good sense for how large these rooms are, what the square footage of an area is. I can show you all the things I would want to see and make you, you know, walk back through the room as many times as, as necessary to, to get comfortable with it. Uh, and you can do a lot virtually. You can do a lot more, I think, than, than we all realized with people in two different rooms as long as everybody's got a camera. Who doesn't have a camera now? Everybody's got a smartphone. So everyone is literally carrying a, a high quality video camera on them all the time. Uh, so that's something we're learning. Uh, and it's, it's something we're learning to adapt to. But it's probably I, Mark, I want to hear some people here uh, that are on here right now. What tools are you guys using to move your business forward, to, to move whether it's your investment business forward, your building business forward, your construction business forward. I mean, we're using Zoom, like yeah. every, like it's going out of crazy, like going out yeah. of style. And we're using um, StreamYard now. There's yeah. also Restream. Um, and there's some tactics of how we're doing that internal. But I'm curious if anybody else is using anything. Josh, I don't know, Josh, if you're still on here, if you're using any tech, because I know he he loves using tech and data, right? Um, but if well, anybody's using it, just post it, and we'll make sure that we post it up here. Yeah, I tell you, one that I'm using now is an app called Duo. Uh, that's your video kind of, it's FaceTime for any phone. Uh, so you can have it on an Android or an Apple phone, uh, and it lets you do a, a FaceTime video chat. Uh, it's great. It, it works fine. Great camera, great sound. Uh, we're able to host virtual meetings that way. Uh, so yep, Zoom, Facebook Messenger, Hangouts. Yep. yep. Uh, and Zoom got hacked the other day, so that was kind of fun. Yeah, so we may have some uh, inadvertent Russian participants today or something. So uh, <laughs> cool. those are for our, our Russian peeps. Yeah, so so Nico is using Zoom from uh, for his construction company, Fine Craft Contractors. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. And then let's see, what did Josh say here? Oh, hang on. Still full, still full for on for co okay. Yeah, I know Josh said it at Casa Connect. Uh, he's kind of uh, modified co construct for his business. Uh, and that lets them do a lot uh, and keep track of their teams out of the office without having to physically go everywhere all the time onto every job. Uh, and check in on what guys are doing. So yeah, it's it's going to force us all to get better at that. Uh, you don't you don't want to be everywhere all the time anyway. So this is going to break uh, some bad habits. Uh, and actually, that's another thing we can talk about. Uh, you mentioned it on a previous video, but it's not so much a tool or a strategy, but a, a an opportunity for relief. Uh, do we want to talk really quickly about CARES Act and yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. How many, how many, if you're a landlord in here, raise your hand, right? Say, I am, right? Yeah. I am. I'm a landlord. Got a bunch of, we've got 50% rent, rent collect, you know, rent is coming this month. A little scary. So when you say you've got 50%, what does that mean? So 50% of our tenants have paid so far this month. Gotcha. Okay. So here we are the the 7th of April, and you have already collected rent. You've seen rent from half that, I guess, was due April 1st. Due April 1st, the 5th is really kind of the cutoff where we see the majority of it come in. And and we want to be able to help people. Like We're all in this together, Mark. Everybody's in this together, right? right. So we want to be able to work with our people um, in this time. We want to be empathetic to their needs um, and, uh, and we, and we also run a business. So it's like that, that, you know, that balancing act. So we're, um, we are, I'm telling tenants if whatever they have that they can afford to pay, it will count towards their rent payment and, but just make it right. Cause some of them have said, well, I've got part now I'll be able to get another part and we've got stimulus money that might come in. So that might help people. Right. Okay. Have you had any tenants? already approach you to say that they weren't going to make it or is this from you approaching them? No, this is me approaching them. 
I was you got proactive. You right, went to I got proactive. And said, I yep. think this is going to be an issue. Let me just tell you what I'm thinking. That's kind of how you approached it. That's right. One of my tenants um, runs a little daycare, a legal daycare out of uh, the house. Yeah. And she, I knew she was going to be in trouble, right? She's yeah. a Spanish speaker. I knew that, you know, people weren't going to be sending their to their kids there because right. complete lockdown. And so um, I told her about applying for the EIDL uh, disaster relief program that's there. Yep. She was completely unaware of it. She didn't know um, because English is a second language for her. I, I got her teenage daughter to help fill out the application. I said, listen, you're a business owner. You file taxes as a business owner. Do this, right? And I directed her to that site. Now she doesn't have payroll, but she is, um, she, she is, uh, she's got uh, her LLC EIN. So I was like, yep. Go here and, and make that happen. Okay. So we have not been proactive with our uh, couple of rentals because you know, the hope is one of them I know is a government contractor and uh, uh, we've got one where it's, we think they're a working from home, still professional type. So I'm kind of leaving, leaving well enough alone uh, until and unless rent doesn't show up. I, if it shows up, then great. Then you know, we'll make our mortgage payments too, and everything kind of holds firm. If it doesn't show up, then I will have those same conversations that you're having. And I think that's what everyone is being told is to talk to your tenants and tenants talk to your landlords and work something out and say, hey, do what you can. Um, and you have done a little bit more research on this, but my understanding is as a landlord, if you are impacted and you don't collect your rent, you should be able to defer mortgage payments with your lender, right? Yeah, you have to be careful with that, guys. You've got, you know, read the front, the fine print. Every lender is going to handle it differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can, you can call and you could find out how they are going to handle any forbearance, right? And uh, the, the amount of allowable time is pretty extensive for a forbearance on units, one to four units, right? So if you've got a Fannie or Freddie or USDA loan or any government-backed loan, they have put in place these programs if you've been negatively impacted. and But you just have to be careful because some of the banks are saying that, yes, we'll defer, we'll, we'll have a forbearance, we'll defer, but then at the end of three months, four months, however long it is, boom, like you've got to pay it all at once. And that's not practical. Right. That's that's right. not going to be helpful. I no. do know that some of my, you know, I have a friend of mine, Angelo. I don't know if Angelo's on here. He's got 36 units or so. And mm -hmm. he's banking on the fact that they will, he, you know, he called and he said, I'm, I'm claiming forbearance on all of them. Right. Okay. Um, he's banking on the fact that they're going to do some kind of, you know, fixing on the back end. Right. As far as, you know, even though he was told that they would collect all the money at the end of four months um, or three months, he he thinks that the government's going to jump in and, 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 and help with the restructuring of, of that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm like, dude, that's a big risk. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to happen. Right. Yeah. So I wouldn't bank on it was my whole thing. Yeah. Well, it, it also depends, I think on where you live and where your properties are. I think DC just today announced I think it was a 90 day prohibition on foreclosures and evictions and at least foreclosures, possibly evictions. Well, evictions uh, is like, evictions here in Northern Virginia has been like that, you know, pretty much since day one. Yeah. So, well, how long is the prohibition on evictions in Virginia? Uh, 90 days. Okay. So Nico said, uh, can't they just distribute the deferred payments throughout the rest of the loan. They can, and some of them are just tacking them to the back of the loan. Right. But you have to ask them, okay, if I agree to this for forbearance, how are you going to handle this? Find out on the front end. That's all I'm saying, because every bank is going to handle it different. Dude, I just assumed that forbearance means they just tacked it onto the end. They don't. And just pause the payment. That's crazy. You're, you're saying some lenders are actually going to try to collect on that 
paused payment and not really forbear and not defer. They just held off on collection for two months. That's correct. That's, that's probably not going to do a lot of good. That that could cause some damage. I can cause it. So that's why Angela is like, I don't believe that, you know, they're going that 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 will actually happen. I think that would be chaos. So right. I, I believe that they're going to distribute it throughout the course of the loan, redistribute it throughout the course of the loan, or tack it onto the back of the loan, which makes the most sense. Right. But you just have to ask, is the it, it, you know, talk well, talk to your lender, communicate is the is the key. Right. So then let's talk about the other end of it. That's the landlord forbearance. Then we have paycheck, paycheck protection and the disaster loan program, Yeah. Uh, which somebody tell me if you've had any uh, response at all from uh, a lender actually offering the paycheck protect, protection or the disaster loan program. Um, I can tell you my personal experience and uh, well, uh, the experience is we bank uh, for most of the businesses at Capital One, a uh, large national bank, right? And I've thought for years about changing and moving to a regional or a local bank, mostly for access to better loans, right? Uh, we all know if you're gonna borrow money from a bank, you're much better off. You're much more likely to get a loan. You're much more likely to get better terms from a local bank but we didn't really use them right for our deals we've got partners we've got private funding we've got a lot of really good lender contacts and friends that we get money from and i never really needed bank money for any of our projects mm -hmm. uh, so shame on me uh, i never changed that banking relationship and now i think it has come back to bite me and, and hopefully won't cost me tens of thousands of dollars because Capital One, my bank, and if if anything I can ever do ever could go viral, let it be this. Uh, <laughs> Capital One has inexplicably, uh, criminally refused to participate in the program. They haven't opened up the Paycheck Protection Program to anyone. You can't submit an application. They're not even taking names. You can't even put your name in the hopper to be on the list to be called back nothing. Um, yeah. Wells Fargo, at least taking applications. Bank of America is taking applications. So don't tell me you can't do it. They could do it. Local banks are doing it. John Marshall is taking applications. Uh, I think Main Street around here probably. Yeah. I mean, I, m and right? Yeah. We, we've been banking with M&T for a decade. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in discussions with my relationship manager. My relationship manager was telling me play by play what was happening the when it opened up to everybody it was on friday right and they said we can't do it on friday because our portal isn't ready but they were right. working hard over the weekend to ensure that it would be ready for monday at monday at 5 a.m i got a text from him saying it's open right and we applied straight away and um and i'm like man that and by the way it it, it was an easy application. We had all the documentation already prepared because they, they were already telling us everything that was going to be required. And right. it took, you know, it took 40 minutes only because I was confused by some of the questions, but it relatively an easy process, right? right. So another reason to be banking at a local bank where you've got right. local relationships. Um, and by the way, Mark, I don't know if you saw this, like, yes, Wells is lending, but I saw that they were putting a cap of 10 billion Correct. Of money, right? They're already capped. They're already capped. Yep. Right. Yep. Barry actually just made that point. Uh, Wells is capped. Uh, Bank of America is not saying they're capped, but I think they're saying that they've already taken like a, a billion dollars or something in, uh, in applications already. Uh, so if they're not, they're about to be with the amount that's already been dedicated out of the 350 billion that's supposed to go to small businesses. Uh, my guess is a good, good chunk of that has probably already been spoken for, uh, at least by the banks who are currently participating. So again, uh, Capital One sucks. Uh, and when all this is over, this will be the the straw that, that breaks my back to actually get me uh, off my butt and go to a local bank and establish a good relationship. So looking for that, uh, it's a great use of our network. Yeah, so if any local bankers, Mark, Mark, 
Mark is is here for you. Arms wide open. Nico said, in times like these, wouldn't it benefit uh, from a you know having a HELOC and pull as you need under your terms? Yes, and we have HELOCs. And my concern is those HELOCs could get pulled. Um, we saw some of that happen in 2008, 2009. Um, although I've talked to a lot of people and they don't feel that that would happen again, but I saw it happen before. So right. I, it depends on a couple of things, I guess, how stressed the banks get, how distressed the market gets and how distressed you personally get. I, if you personally run into other financial issues and you have a HELOC out, you can you know, trip the provisions where uh, your HELOC gets called. So that's always a, a downside to the HELOC. Uh, but what's most frustrating is you know, this, this CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection uh, Program is free money. It's literally a grant that if you have payroll, like we do, and you intend to use that money for your payroll, which we would to keep people employed or bring them back that you had to furlough or lay off, uh, it, it's free. They will uh, turn the, the loan into a grant and you don't have to pay it back. It actually is, for once, a real legitimate bailout for small business and Main Street, if you want to call it that. You know, those of us that employ 70% of our workers uh, in small businesses with under 500 employees. Uh, but they clearly haven't set aside enough money for it. They very clearly did not set up the system uh, to work properly from the beginning. And I can only hope that, and what I've heard is, we're only two or three tranches in to you know five and six and seven rounds of this kind of bailout that could and, and should and hopefully is coming. Uh, and we can we can talk about you know global economic theory as to what that means uh, in the way of inflation and interest rates and just giving free money to people. But if they really do intend to stop the bleeding right now in the short term, uh, they need to to be you know getting that money out there and hopefully getting more of it available. So we'll see if that happens. Yeah. Yep. So I would just say if you if uh, if you if your process with your bank was smooth, and of course I don't think anybody's received any money yet, right? But if your right. process was smooth, you might just want to say, "Hey, bank at M and T, and it was great experience." Like that, my my application was a great experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, give a shout out to your local bank or your local relationship manager. The powers in the network. It's in the relationships that we form here. So we want to continue promoting the people that help move the community forward. And and, th and this is just part of that, right? Right. I've heard really good things about John Marshall Bank. So I'm looking forward to having that conversation when all this is over. Uh, so maybe so uh, if you're a landlord, just know you've got some remedies that are there. If you're running a real estate team, a wholesale business, a construction company, it sounds like we're all pivoting. We've been pivoting in the last three four weeks and going online using a lot of the tools of Zoom and StreamYard and all the rest. So why don't we talk about our topic and then we'll talk about how, what we're seeing, where the, well, I guess where the opportunity is going to be, you know, uh, and where the, um, where the cheese is being moved to, that's probably a better way, way to say it. And then sure. how are we going to adapt and, and help people through this difficult time? Right. And I'm getting a little bit of an echo, uh, Mark. Are you hearing that? Yeah, a little bit, but I think it went away. Okay. Back. So the the topic for the evening is how to uh, identify and negotiate with a motivated seller. And I think one thing we can probably agree on uh, is there may, there, there will be some increase in motivation as a result of the economic uh, upheaval that we're having, right? I uh, don't want to be you know, super negative. I don't think the bottom is going to fall out, but this will cause stress for some people uh, and it will cause some financial problems and problems are things that we solve as real estate investors, right? That's right. Uh, that's really what we do, we're looking for problems to solve. We're not looking for deals. There's no such thing as, as free money uh, out there. Uh, you solve a problem and in exchange for helping someone solve a problem, uh, you can hopefully uh, earn a fee, right? Or be paid for that. Uh, so we're looking for people who may be motivated by something uh, in their life or with their property, or with their real estate that presents a problem to them that we can solve as real estate investors who can take on a property uh, that has problems or can move faster than someone uh, who doesn't do what we do. 
uh, and can do things for, for sellers that other people can't. Uh, so let's kind of maybe talk about uh, what things might motivate people, uh, yeah. what those problems are that we can solve and how we solve them, right? So uh, sellers are motivated by uh, circumstances or emotion to sell a property uh, for less than what you might typically say is the market value under normal uh, circumstances. And I think everyone already kind of understands what normal circumstances are. You got a house in decent shape, you hire you know, a great agent from the Casa Group to do their thing, to market the house, sell it on the open market for as much as you can possibly get for it from a ready, willing and able, able buyer. And why would anyone ever do anything other than that, right? Uh, the reason someone might do something other than that is because there's something going on you know, in their life uh, that motivates them. So we talk about two things, circumstance and emotion uh, that motivate people. Uh, and in order then, uh, circumstances are- Let me just thin. jump in right now. Like Shri, who has a lot of the notes, right? He's like, yeah. he's been seeing a lot of non-performing tapes for sale in the last two weeks. I yeah. anticipate we're going to see more and more of that, right? Um, unfortunately, as a society, we haven't done a great job of saving money. And, um, and people do live paycheck to paycheck in a lot of parts of uh, the country. Yeah. And this has been an astronomical amount of time for the gig economy to be out of work. So think of, you know, all those people that were making their money driving Ubers and Lyfts and, um, you know, they own property, they own houses, they, they um, you know, this has been difficult, right? The hospitality industry, retail industry. I mean, one of my idols is, is Richard Branson. I love Richard Branson. I think the guy's amazing. And think about the chaos that his business has been thrown into right now, right? He's in the cruise industry. He's in the airline industry. He's in the hotel industry. I mean, it's like, it's unreal. And so you're going to, you're going to see people from all walks of life that are going to experience circumstance, Mark, right. that they're going to, you know, right now the workouts, but what's going to happen is that over time, those will diminish and people will still be in pain. And right. we have the opportunity to be able to help solve people's problems. Yep. So you're talking about financial circumstance that is going to be thrust upon you as a result of you know, the economic damage of this kind of work stoppage or self-imposed work stoppage. Uh, there is physical circumstance surrounding the house. That's probably one of the most common things when we're not dealing with a situation like we have right now. The thing we see most common as investors are just rough houses, right? Houses that need some renovation, uh, that will not be appealing to most buyers, that may not even be financeable to some buyers. Uh, the, the circumstance is the property condition. House has been abandoned or it's got a hole in the ceiling or it's got three feet of water in the basement. Um, it's got real problems that you can't just solve with some paint and carpet and somebody with vision and cash and a lot of acceptance of, of headache and work uh, is going to have to take that on. Uh, so that's, that's pretty obvious, I guess. Uh, we see a lot of that. Uh, so the financial one, uh, like you said, if you've moved and you've got two mortgages, you've relocated, you've uh, had a job loss or other income loss or an income earner uh, is leaving your, your family, uh, that causes an issue. Uh, time the, becomes a factor with some of these, right? Uh, I think pre-foreclosure is, is unfortunately going to come back into our market at higher rates than it currently is. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a problem uh, that we can potentially solve. Uh, do you want to talk for a second about how, how pre-foreclosure works? Yeah. And what I was going to do is I was going to go back to this one question that Nico yeah. had, right? Sure. And he said, what do you mean uh, by they were pulled? Do you mean that they were pulled even though people had applied or they simply stopped to offer the HELOC problem? So what happened was there was many people that had HELOCs, right, on um, that they maybe had drawn 30000 of a $100,000 line. And then, Nico, the bank said, we've cut it and you can no longer draw anymore. And that happened in 2008, 2007, 2008, as the market was sliding down. And it put people in 
a very difficult situation. Um, and so my concern was whether that would occur again. I, I don't believe it it will because uh, it's one of these things where, you know, the, the all of us are in it together. Uh, the president that we have in now, he got his lines pulled at one point. So I doubt that he would allow that kind of mandate to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but that did, that did occur. And I saw it almost take uh, a lot of, well, I saw, I saw it take a lot of investors you know, um, out, right? Yeah. I do know that in the capital markets, um, a lot of hard money lenders, you know, that were borrowing money from Wall Street, some of those lines got, you know, they got pulled, uh, yeah. unfortunately, because they're, they're, they're just worried. They they wanted to pause everything, and so uh, most of the lenders have been able to figure that out. Uh, but it is a it's been a reality, right? So uh, I just and I think it can get worse. Again, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be quite as bad with lines being uh, pulled as it was during the last downturn. That was a real estate recession. This is a, a medical emergency. Uh, but it could be even worse than that, that if you are overextended and the value of the property that's backing that HELOC goes down uh, to where their loan to value ratio no longer looks good, they can not only say, not only can you not borrow the rest of that loan, but by the way, we need the portion of the HELOC that you've already borrowed back. And you've got 45 days to send us a check for whatever you've already taken out because they are different than a mortgage. It's just like you said about talking to your lenders about the fine print for forbearance, um, times like these get you reading the fine print of your HELOCs, of your insurance, yeah. right? Now is yeah. when you learn to read fine print. Uh, so read the fine print of your equity lines before you take them, if you intend to draw them uh, and find out if they can be pulled or revoked or called due. Well, Mark, I don't know. Maybe I was the only person that, that called my insurance agent to figure out whether or not my insurance covered for some kind of pandemic, right? I was like, you, okay, I know I have this. Were not. Yeah, and you were not the only one. I know. I know I wasn't the only one, right? Yep. So it's a very real thing. Yeah, this is this is going to be our opportunity to learn to read the fine print, right? What's Sri saying? Seeing I'm back. seeing lenders asking higher down payment for jumbo loans for loans, which were approved in the past and closing was about to happen in a month. Yep. I'm seeing deals. This is what's happened to us uh, a little bit over the last um, week, where you get a clear to close, and then every and then what's happening is that they're doing a last minute employment verification, and you can't get a hold of the HR department to do that employment verification. We went through that today on a pretty substantial. I think it was a, a 1.2 million dollar deal. Uh, luckily, we were able to. to to make it happen, but we had another one where they did the employment verification. It was clear to close. They're at the table, and they did a last minute employment verification, and it got pulled because they said, "Hey, we've we've essentially eliminated the rule." Wow, that's what's part of what's happening right now that we just got to adjust with, right? So, when you're qualifying as an investor and you're selling your product, you need to be asking all the right questions, right? We're going to get into questions. Uh, in more detail in a little bit, but um, it's now more than ever. You got to make sure that you understand who your buyer is. Yep. And so Sri specifically mentions jumbo loans. I'm assuming you've heard that a lot of lenders are not doing jumbo loans, right? Uh, yep. So you're going to have to go back to getting a second uh, if you're buying something and borrowing more than you know, whatever that, that max is in this area, 500, whatever. Uh, they're just backing away from jumbos because they can't sell them uh, on the CMBS market. And if you can't sell that package loan to somebody else down the road, you're not going to make it. Uh, it doesn't mean you won't be able to buy those houses. You'll just have to do it with a, a second or a third you know, like we used to. Uh, so not necessarily a huge impact from that one thing, but that is a product that we're already seeing. The product is going away as a temporary response to the instability in the, the lending market. So things are going to happen. Uh, don't know exactly what. We don't know exactly how bad it may or may not get. Uh, it doesn't seem like it should be nearly as bad as the real estate recession that we came out of 10 years ago because that was caused by bad loans. 
um, and people owning real estate that maybe shouldn't have. That really wasn't the case going into this, um, but there will be some turmoil uh, that comes out of this. Uh, and so that's going to be a, a motivating factor. Uh, but those circumstantial motivating factors really have to do with the property itself, uh, the finances of the seller and any kind of time frame or external pressure that the seller has. Well, that's, I remember that's what we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, pre foreclosure. How does the pre foreclosure discussion happen? Uh, where do you find those those sellers and how do you start those discussions on a pre foreclosure? Well, all of them actually uh, by law have to be announced um, in the paper. Right. So th there are a number of uh, attorneys out there that specialize in this, like uh, Samuel White is a big one out of Virginia Beach. You can go to Samuel White's website. On that website, um, they list all their for, all their uh, pending auctions, right? All the pending auctions that they have. And if you if you go and you start, if you, if you wanna reverse engineer this and you go into your local paper and you could see where they've placed the ad for that property that's being auctioned in the newspaper, which is what they need to do by law. You can go to the Washington Post, look at that, or you can go to the classified section Right now in WashingtonPost.com, you can look at that. You could see all the uh, attorneys that specialize in this, and then you can go to their websites and you can see what they have coming up. And what we do with our uh, VAs, our virtual assistants, is that we have them take that data on a daily basis and then send it to us in a in a spreadsheet format with phone numbers and addresses and and um, and you could start engaging people in conversation to help them through this process because many people don't understand that there's lots of tools and remedies and, and strategies to help um, either keep them in the house by doing modifications uh, or helping them sell that property while they still have equity in the property so that it doesn't go to the auction and, or just buying their time in the process uh, by negotiating directly with the bank. So there's lots of strategies to help people uh, that are experiencing that pre-foreclosure, um, uh, experiencing pre-foreclosure, but it all starts with the empathy, Mark. You have to have empathy for the situation. We're going to see more and more of this in the coming months. Mm -hmm. And so as we talk about this, um, we need to make sure that we're leading with empathy and helping people through this process. That's a good point. So then how do you start that conversation Let's say you've got a list. You went to the paper, you say, all right, here are some houses in a neighborhood where I would like to own yeah. uh, that are showing 30, 60, 90 day late. They are in foreclosure. The bank is threatening to come and take the house. Yeah. What do you do? Do you try to reach them with like letters or postcards? And if you do yeah. that, how do you, how do you show empathy in a postcard? Are you talking about like knocking on doors? What are your yeah. strategies for reaching? All of it. Right. So this is why I believe in, in picking a hyper local geographic area so that you could be omnipresent in that area. And it means calling, sending direct mail, door knocking, calling, sending direct mail, door knocking. Right. When we first started in the business, uh, my wife and I actually my wife, Kim, she would she would go and she would knock on those doors and she would essentially, you know, knock on the door and just say, Hey, my name is Kim Chavez and uh, I'm with ABC property solutions uh, business. And I, I, I realize that you're experiencing a difficult time and your property is going um, to auction. I'm not sure whether or not you're aware of that because by the way, many, many times they weren't aware that it was actually an auction date had been yeah. set Mark, because guess what they do with that mail. Most of the times they don't open it. Yeah. I don't want to look at it. Yeah. Right? If I don't, if I don't see it, it's not there. <laughs> right. Yeah. If I don't see it, it's not, open the letter, it's not happening. And so many times we would, we would just lead with that empathy and say, Hey, uh, we realize that this is a case. We have strategies and solutions that can help slow down this process or stop this process or help you out of the problem. Because our mm -hmm. goal was always to help people solve the problem. And if they could solve the problem, we want them to stay where they're at. If they, if after exhausting all those resources, they couldn't solve the problem, there was no way to solve it, right? And there's only a couple of ways to solve it. Either like, you're gonna have to come with all the money, you're gonna have to borrow it from somebody, right? If you don't have it yourself yeah. and, and bring that loan, you know, current. Um, 
get some kind of modification, so that, which means that you have to communicate with the bank and get some kind of modification. But many times people are paralyzed by fear. A lot of people are experiencing fear right now. So people are paralyzed by fear, so they don't take a proactive stance. And sometimes it just takes an empathetic you know, ear and, and giving them the right tools and advice to go and, and take action in so, some of those areas uh, to stop it. Uh, unfortunately, many times, by the time people call us, they'll say, you know, um, I have an auction and it's, guess when it is, Mark? It's Friday, tomorrow, right? right? And so, well, that, you know, there's there's fewer options at that point and we give them the right advice for whatever their circumstance is at that time. Yep. So, but the, the goal is to always lead with empathy and to help them with solutions. And depending on their solution, you know, I've had situations where husband and wife are going through a divorce, the property's in pre-foreclosure status, they're mad at each other, there's 100,000 in equity, and they don't want to talk, and they're willing to let this property go to auction, right? right? Because they're just mad at each other. So I have to play therapist and bring them together. And 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 like, I remember having a discussion with this one husband, uh, and I was like, Fifty thousand dollars. I we can put fifty thousand dollars in your hand, and he was like, "I don't want her to get fifty thousand. I'm like, "Listen, I get it, but I'm going to put fifty thousand in your hands. So right. let's figure this out, right?" And we figured it out. So yeah. sometimes and, you just need a referee, right? Yep. And so you're bringing up the the next slide, the next motivator, which is emotion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are some circumstances where you are emotionally uh, divested from uh, this property that you own. The situation yeah. uh, is something that you want out of and you no longer not even love this home. You might even like this home anymore, right? Yeah. Uh, we just had a situation not long ago with a house that was uh, unfortunately a hoarding situation uh, and it had gotten way out of control on a number of levels. Uh, and one of the family members was like, this house just needs to be knocked down. Just knock it down. We don't, we'll go partly do that. Uh, actually, that's part of the, the plan, but maybe uh, not all of it. Uh, but the point is, at a certain point, the house becomes like an albatross, right? This, this house is a, a monkey on it's your burning. back. What other, what other animal references I can make? But the, the house is an emotional problem for you that it makes you sad or angry every time you look at it. And that is a motivating factor. That person wants that thing out of their life or they want the person uh, out of their life uh, and they can't make that happen until you deal with the real estate, right? So that's what you were just talking about. Uh, you start with empathy. You you be the the referee, the therapist, you've, you've got to be a few things, right? When you're dealing with an emotional situation. Rapport, right. Yeah. Rapport is an important part of this entire process. And how do you build rapport? You build rapport by listening and, yep. um, and understanding and, and meeting them where they're at right. and, uh, coming up with, uh, solutions and, um, and, uh, and caring, right. Yep. Uh, so you, not, you not gotta judgment. be able to Right, so you know the, the second item on the list here, embarrassment, and that really does come up sometimes. Uh, people do get embarrassed about the condition that a house is in, or they're embarrassed about the financial distress that they're on. They don't want their friends and family and neighbors to know what's going on. Uh, so it, part of empathy is discretion. I, and we, we make that part of it. We say, by the way, we can make it so that you can close the door behind you, move on, and no one has to know what's going on. Uh, yeah. We'll take it over. We'll clean it up. We'll take everything out the back if we have to. We'll help you move if you need to. We'll get some moving trucks and moving boxes, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll move this stuff out. Uh, we don't have to drag it all out onto the lawn. Uh, it's whatever whatever solves the problem, right? What is the seller afraid of? What is keeping them from moving forward? Uh, find out what that thing is, offer them a way to move forward, and that's where your opportunity is, is gonna come from. But it, it does start with, with empathy and really genuinely trying to be of some kind of service and, and help. Uh, and so I, I find 
uh, that our best deals come from situations where we can really do what you said and just listen uh, and let people explain you know what has happened to the degree that they want to I uh, don't judge don't you know mock or make fun or shake your head or anything else at, at what someone is telling you uh, and and just say that sounds pretty terrible or I can see what you've been uh, dealing with here uh, I think I can help with that I think I can make this go away I think I can help you with a clean start uh, this is not a problem for me we deal with whatever this is, we deal with this issue all the time. Uh, it's something that we're comfortable with that we can take on. And once we take it on, you can take it off, right? You walk out the door, you close that door behind you and you're done. Uh, try to work that into most of the conversations because that's usually a pretty good motivator uh, for people to know that they can literally, they can see themselves walking out the door, closing the door and leaving this house in the rearview mirror. That's, yep. that is what we offer. That's the solution we offer. Yeah. Uh, so things that, but you have to get to the bottom of what the root problem is, right? right? And then yep. and, and then do your best to solve that problem. Yep. If they're you know tired of getting phone calls from their tenant at you know two o'clock in the morning uh, about their leaky toilet, say so, yeah, I I understand. I I have had oh, a few I understand. Other properties. I, I know exactly, right? You know exactly what that call is. Oh my god! How many times do you go out to all of our properties, Mark? It's right. like oh my god. You know. uh, being a landlord is not for everyone, right? You have to be able to it. deal with those things. Uh, and if you're not and you don't enjoy that, it can make you emotionally detached from that property. Uh, so, okay. well, I don't know what that beep was. That was that was my computer. I think okay. I'm having a battery issue, so I may have to deal with oh, that. Shoot. Okay. That's uh, fine. Let me go to the next slide. The entire, shut the entire presentation down. No big deal. So the big thing is the seller's motivated by circumstance. They need the house sold. Something's going on. The house is broken. They're in financial distress. The house has to be sold. And the seller motiv motivated by emotion wants this thing out of their life, right? It's a it's a problem that they want out. And by um, the way, right. guys, if you have questions about any of this stuff, you know, and, and Mark, we've covered some of this stuff because I know I skipped ahead. Yep. We'll, we'll go through it. I just want people to ask questions, right? Sure. Uh, Tara says, let me just, put this yeah, you answer that question. I'm going to go deal with a quick power you, issue. You go, you be fix right it. back. Thanks for going over what you would say when door knocking. Would you say essentially the same thing with empathy in a letter by bringing up the problem? Uh, I would right? um, uh, with a phone call in a letter door knocking, you're there to help solve their problem and you want to do it in a, in a discreet way, in an empathetic way. And, uh, and you want to get, you know, to the point. Um, and so uh, the message stays the same. I can help solve this problem. It just takes a 10 minute conversation and have, and a, at a minimum, I can give you tools, strategies, resources to help you solve the problem so that you can stay where you're at. And if that isn't an option, I can point you in the right direction that will help with whatever whatever issues you're facing. So um, it's about solving all their different issues along the way. Some of the biggest issue, Tara, by the way, is uh, the biggest issue that I run into is people don't know where they're gonna go, right? right. They're worried about where they're gonna go. And so you have to solve that problem for them. Let them know that you would be able to help them find a rental property, help them move, provide a truck, provide storage, um, be creative. Know that that is a very common fear for people. Like I've been in this house, you know, 10 years, uh, all my stuff's here. Like, where do I put it? I don't have the money to put it in the storage. Um, and where, where do I go? My credit's bad. And so it's solving that problem and showing them that there is a path forward and bringing hope in the process. And the people that do that win, they're the win. They're the ones that solve those problems, help people. Yep. Okay. That was a good question. So speaking of questions, uh, when we are talking to a seller, usually on the phone, right? If we've sent them a postcard, we're hoping they'll call us. Uh, if you're, uh, we're talking about how to get your point across in a postcard. So one of the absentee landlord postcards says, tired of tenants and toilets, right? Uh, you're yep. tired of tenants and toilets, give us a call, we'll buy the property as is closed in seven days, pay cash, uh, the usual things, right? 
so the phone rings and what are the questions then that we want to be asking to find out if this person that we're talking to has a problem we can solve. Uh, so phone rings, uh, you answer, ABC homebuyer. Uh, so yeah, I got your postcard. What's the deal? You guys buy houses? Uh, uh, we do. And uh, yeah, t tell me a little bit about your situation. Let me see if I can help and, and point you in the right direction if, if I'm not the best person for you. Yep. Uh, and so I started off by saying, by the way, I got your postcard. But if they don't say I got your postcard, uh, I, we usually try to ask them, well, how'd you hear about us? If you just get a phone call out of the blue, uh, that's not usually an issue depending on what your uh, program is. Uh, you can use uh, special phone numbers for different programs, right? So if we've got a, uh, a landlord postcard mailer, we can give that its own phone number so that when a call comes in on that number, you know that they're calling from the absentee landlord number. But if you're not there yet, but you are sending out postcards or sending out letters or leaving you know, flyers on doors. We, uh, use, pre -foreclosure list. we use a program called Dialogue Tech and Dialogue sure. Tech does a little whisper. It'll say uh, pre-foreclosure letter or right. short sale letter or um, you know wh whatever marketing that we've associated with it. And so we, we know how to, what, what essentially puts you in the right frame of mind to know what script you're going to have. Right. It's about connecting with a person. Sure, I'd love to help. Tell me your name. Tell me a little bit about the situation. If I can't help, Mark, I'll certainly see if I can po point you in the right direction. It yep. takes the edge off, right? right? That simple little script that takes the yep. edge off. Yep. And then um, I just, I, and by the way, then I just want to know. I'm curious. If you're a curious person and you ask questions to help understand the entire situation, uh, then you're able to solve the problem for the person, right? So don't get robotic and be, you know, and 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 ask questions off a list. I want you to genuinely understand. Like the only way you're going to be able to help this person is by asking great questions to get to the bottom of what the problem is, the issue, so that you can formulate a solution, right? Yeah. So that that's important because sometimes people will just go off a script. And they won't develop a rapport in that process. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, you'll need to get some information, but you certainly don't have to read down a list and fill in the blank to get it, right? Uh, you need some basic information about the house, obviously. Can you tell me the address of the house? Uh, and then as soon as you have the address, hopefully you're talking to someone in front of a computer. So you're logged on to your MLS. You're starting to do your comps. You're trying to figure out what this house is worth. Mm -hmm. uh, another reason to stick to a geographic area, right? I don't have to look as hard to know what a house is worth here in your South Reston. It's the area that I want to work in. Uh, I know a lot about it already. I'm already a little bit uh, ahead of the game as opposed to if somebody's calling you know, on something hundreds of miles away. Uh, but regardless, you get the information about where the house is and then start doing your research, hopefully right there on the phone uh, or find a way to get the information from them and then uh, call them back if you have to. Uh, but you're asking basic information about the house uh, bedroom, bathroom, square footage, whether they know about it. Uh, I think relatively important to ask earlier in the conversation, is this house listed for sale? That's kind of important, right? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I got an agent. Okay, well, I already know they're probably not super motivated if they've already got the house on the market. They within might be the motivated. The agent can be stuck motivated. In. They're calling you because the agent isn't doing their job, right? And so they, they, you know? It depends. If it's day one, probably not motivated. If it's day 181, then you're right. Maybe they are getting motivated. Uh, kind of depends maybe on when your postcard shows up uh, versus where they are in the cycle. But if it is on the market, okay, well, you haven't had any offers? Always good to know. Starting yeah. that price discussion uh, or where, you know, how long have you been on the market? Who's marketing it? Who's your agent? Uh, just good general stuff to know. And actually, while we're Talking about our questions, are you able to make that question banner at the bottom smaller so we can see the rest of the questions on the list? There you go. Hide it. There we go. Sorry, so Tara. we're asking questions about the house, right? By the way, ask your questions. I like pu putting questions up there. I want to make this more interactive than just us, like two talking heads, right? I get bored listening to Mark all the time. Oh, no <laughs> doubt. Me too. <laughs>
Uh, but we're asking about the house, right? So when was the last time the kitchen and bathroom was renovated? Everybody knows the kitchens and bathrooms are important and they'll know if it hasn't been renovated in 15 years. Uh, so, hey, when was the last time the kitchen was renovated? Uh, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, 50 years ago, never, right? Uh, I think, I feel like what I'm hoping to hear is never. Uh, that's usually the best case scenario. This is mom's house. I inherited it. It's never been renovated. It's a 1950s time capsule. Yeah, right. I live in that, California. The house is paid for free and clear. Right. Right. But I think there's a structural problem in the basement. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I don't want to fool around with it. Yeah. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. Uh, it's a really good reason to try to find people with out of state uh, houses because it's more yeah. likely to happen then. Uh, so ask them when the last time things were renovated or uh, ask general condition about things like the roof and the HVAC. Do you know how old that is? A couple of reasons. One, you do generally want to know, uh, although chances are pretty good if they're responding to my marketing, it's probably not a really pretty recently renovated house, but it also kind of helps reinforce the later conversation that we're going to have about value for them to be thinking, yeah, he's right. It's still got the original HVAC from 25 years ago. Yeah, I haven't done anything with the roof. No, I haven't renovated the kitchen. Uh, it starts to then make sense why I have to buy the house where I do, because I've got to do all that work. I've got to renovate all of that uh, space, and I have to take that risk of Martin, putting more money into the house. Nobody right. sells. I want people to, to read if they've never read it. We've talked about this before. It's called uh, Never Split the Difference. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk, if we go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about negative selling, right? Yep. Uh, and, and the power of, of takeaways. Um, and so, uh, I want to make sure that we, we're already at an hour and three and I want to make sure that All right. we stay well, on. I'll run through these last ones, but they are kind of important. Uh, you really do need to ask, uh, is the mortgage current, right? We were just talking about a pre foreclosure. Uh, is the, the mortgage on the house current? Uh, yeah. Why do you ask? Well, is it not always the case and we can help. Uh, no matter what the, the mortgage status is, but I need to know so that I can know what kind of help to offer. Uh, if the mortgage is current, that's great. Then you don't need to know what I would be able to do about it if it wasn't, right? But if they say, no, uh, actually it's not, that's your chance to ask, okay, have you gotten any notices from your bank? Oh yeah, it's going to auction on Friday. And then like you said, you have to change the conversation. Okay, here's what I can do to help you by Friday. Uh, you ask if there are any liens or judgments. Uh, if you've got that rapport built, we can ask that when we get to the house too. It really just kind of depends on how the conversation is going. But again, you're going to need to know eventually anyway. And if there's an issue there and there's a lien and a judgment, it's again, a problem that you can solve. Not a problem. We can deal with that. Uh, we can find out you know, who the current lien holder is and we can get that paid off for you. So you need to know. Paul, Paul asked a question. He said, yep. what are your thoughts on using seller valuation tools I buyer AVMs, estimate, et cetera. How can we combat, address this with motivated sellers? What I always tell a seller, I'm Paul, I'm assuming that they might say, well, my house, my estimate says it's worth $500,000, right? right? And um, and what I, I always make everybody aware of is, you know, the estimate is a, a fantastic tool, uh, but there's some, certain things it just doesn't know, right? It takes per square foot, it takes averages, and when you actually look at the valuation of the property, it's always price in relation to its condition, price in relation to its location, and price in relation to the time of the year. So what do I what do I mean by that? Well, price in relation to its condition is if the property hasn't been touched in 30 years, that's all obviously going to affect the price. And Zillow doesn't know whether the property's been updated or not, right? Sure. Also, price in relation to its location. Zillow doesn't know if it's backing to power lines or if it backs to a, a double yellow line or the fronts to a double yellow line. And those things negatively impact the value of the property. So, so you just educate. I find that educating people about how price uh, matters in relation to all those things um, matters. And, and, so, and then once you educate people, then they're like, okay, I understand, right? Even in the Zestimate itself, it'll say that there's a 17 or 18% up or down swing that depends, right? So it's just a wag, right? Sometimes they're on, most of the times they're not, so. Uh, yep, 
so you're asking if never eat alone okay another good one uh you're asking if there are any judgments or any liens uh and then uh you're asking all right uh how much is owed on the house in mortgages what's the current mortgage balance well why do you need to know that right. well what we do is buy houses cash as is uh, usually that needs some work to them. We put that work into the house and then hopefully we sell it for more than we've got into it. I need to know though, if I'm going to be able to do that uh, and get the house bought. If the house is worth less than what's owed on it, I can still help with that, but it's a different conversation than if I can just buy your house on Friday, put some money into it and sell it for more than I've got into it. So, uh, so can, I, can I time out real fast? One okay. thing I want to make everybody aware of is that tonality when working with, especially over the phone, tonality is super important. So when people are asking you these questions, your tone matters, right? And the way you respond with your tone matters. So one of the right. reasons why we talk about this is because you can spend a lot of money marketing and get the telephone to ring, but if you don't know what to say and how to say it, and how to use the right tone, you might as well just be burning the money or flushing it down the toilet, right? So in the book, um, uh, um, you never split the difference. He yeah. talks about ra uh, tactical empathy, right? And I remember this before I ever read the book, I remember, you know, knowing that when you have a tone of empathy, when it comes to solving the problem, it always helped me in that process, right? And, and so he, he referred to it as tactical empathy. And I was like, yes, that's what it is. It's like mm -hmm. it's understanding them and, and explaining to them why you need it. Right. So the tone has to be, you know, Mark, the reason why I really need that information is because the more I know about your situation, the better solution I can craft for you. Right. So that I could take you from where you are to where you want to go. And, and by the way, knowing what that mortgage balance is helps me in really figuring that piece out. Right. Right. So that's very different than saying, so what's the balance on your loan? Okay. Now, right. That's that, that could be out of a serial. And so it's super important that you guys study tonality and you study, um, negotiate, just, you know, never split the difference. Um, uh, there's another book that I love reading. Oh, everything in life, you get every, no, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. It was one of yep. the first ones I read a long time ago. So, yep. so. Uh, And what's the best way to get better at it? Yeah, practice and scripting. <laughs> practice, right? And yep. working, not working on the prospect, not working on the person, but working with a teammate, a friend, and, and ask them, how did that make you feel? Like when I said that, how did it how did it make you feel? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we want to be nice to each other and like you'll give me the script and I'll be like, yeah, that sounds good. And really I'm like, no, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> but that didn't make me feel good, right? It so sound good. <laughs> so you, you want to make sure that you're practicing with somebody and they're being honest about how it made them feel and right. whether or not that, that would have moved you forward. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, and then – one of the last questions you ask is, what are you asking for the house, right? I'd ask them how much they want for their house. Well, why do you want to know that? Uh, you guys, your professional home buyers, make me an offer, right? Uh, so how do you respond? How do you respond with empathy but authority uh, to get your answer to try to get them to tell you how much they want to sell the house for? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say, Mark, I'm sure you understand we get lots of calls you know, during the day about people that want to sell us their property. And, um, and I, I, what I find is that every seller has a number in their head that they, they already want. Right. And I'd rather just kind of figure out what it is that you already want to understand whether or not we're even in the same ballpark. Right. And certainly if I'm not the right person for you, I'll try to give you the resources and tools to, 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 to go find whatever that solution is. But I find that every seller has a number and I'm just curious to what your number is. Yep. And then and normally they're like, okay, yes, I want I want 450, right? Right. Uh, and so you want to try to to anchor uh, the conversation somewhere, and it's better if they can give you some kind of number first, 
Uh, and then we always try to say, if you've gotten some kind of number out of them, then you have the rest of the discussion, find out what the issue is that needs resolving, what the problem is, is it with the house? And if it's with the house, which it usually is, great. So I understand um, what you were saying about the house. Uh, sounds, sounds actually like the kind of house I buy all the time. I, I can fix that roof, we'll renovate the house, we'll shine it up, we'll put it out on the market and hopefully uh, you know, top of market value and hopefully we'll be able to get uh, all of our money back uh, out of it and maybe even a profit. Um, if I can do that and if I can get the house you know, bought uh, in the two weeks, whatever it was they said, you said you were looking to close in like two or three weeks, if I can get the deal done in two weeks and get the cash in your hand, what would be the best price you could take for the house? What would be the lowest amount you would take? Uh, and then try to get them to come down a little bit more uh, before making a final offer, uh, which maybe we'll we'll get to after we uh, kind of go through and try a little bit of negative selling on them. Uh, but you want to try to get some kind of an answer or number out of your seller so you have something to kind of anchor the conversation with. Uh, all right, so we're going to make an offer, uh, but we have to have some way of knowing remotely what kind of offer to make. So we try to be talking to sellers at least while we're in front of a computer getting the information or find a way to get the information from them and say, great, I appreciate the information on the house. Let me do a little bit of research and I'll get right back to you and then do get right back to them. Uh, but really have some basis for about, making the offer. Right. It's about speed. So you have to be able to react quickly and you have to be able to provide some kind of number. And Mark, the reason why um, we do this and we do it over the phone instead of visiting every individual house is we're really gauging motivation. And, um, and, we, and, and we are, we're busy. I mean, we're doing other deals and we want to make sure that we're on the same page. So what I found was when we first started in this business, you know, there was a little bit of go fetch. Somebody would say, I'm interested. I want to sell it. We'd ask what you wanted. What do you want for the property? If it was kind of in the ballpark, we figured maybe we'd go. Oh, there. I can get them down. We'll get them down, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then you find like, man, I just wasted like four hours of my life, right? Yep. And so you try to do as much as you possibly can in uh, in a controlled environment over the phone. And by the way, maybe moving forward, we'll do more of this with our sellers. Hey, let me just jump on a, a quick Zoom or let me just jump and let's, you know, show me around the house. Give me a quick tour. Um, tell me a little bit more about your situation. Hey, this is what we do. These are this, these are our offerings. I, I could yeah. see us engaging a little bit more like this. If somebody feels comfortable with technology, you'd have to be able to understand the audience. Um, yeah. But we, you know, we already have all the math set up because we've been doing these for a decade now. We understand the the avatar house that we typically buy. So Mark has the ability to the the anchor a number to see how that seller is going to respond to that number, yep. and um, and I don't know if we can need to go through all the the math for it, Mark, because I want no. to move it forward. But, but this, it would be something along the lines of you. Know, what are you asking? Um, well, you know the estimate says it's worth six seventy five, so I'd probably sell it for six. Okay, get a little more information. All right, so you've told me a little bit about the house. Sounds like maybe the basement needs to be finished. Got some things around the house that need to be done. That sounds fine. We actually do that. If I can do that um, and I'll buy the house completely as is, no tire kicking, no home inspections, no appraisals from a bank, and I can close in the next 14 days, what's the, what's the best price you could give me? What's the lowest you would take for this house? Oh, uh, well, I guess I could go to 590. Okay, so then now you're talking, you're talking again and, and collecting more information. Uh, and then say, so 590? Like, yeah, 590. Can you do any better? Uh, you'd be surprised if you just ask the third time, can you do any better? Get, they'll probably come down at least a little bit more, right? Uh, and then you do the rest of your research, whatever you're using. I say 75, 70 percent of ARV minus renovation. Come back when we talk about estimating renovations. Uh, if you want to know exactly how that works, or you know, take me and Rob out for coffee, uh, we'll explain to you how that works. Come up with your number, whatever it is, and say, okay, well, I, uh, I can buy the the house as is, uh, in cash, uh, with a very short, you know, one hour meeting with you at the house to walk through the house. I'm going to three hey, Mark, contract, get you paid in two days. Barry's so, got a question. 
I think it's good for you to answer this one. Yeah. Knowing ARV and repairs really help, but what about when it's a teardown? How do you get some reasonable numbers in that situation? Yeah. Uh, in some ways, it's actually easier. If you're intending to actually tear down uh, and build a new house, then hopefully you know what it costs you per square foot to build whatever it is you intend to build. Uh, so now you know, my renovation cost is really my build cost, and that's something that the builder should have very good control over. Uh, so you should know I build at $100 a square foot or $115 a square foot or whatever your cost to construct is. Uh, and in that way, teardowns are a lot easier. If you're wholesaling and you don't have a set of plans and you don't know whether it's going to be $100 or $120 a square foot to build a you know 6,000 square foot house in Annandale, then know this, that most uh, infill builder type uh, custom build people uh, will pay anywhere from 25 to 35 percent of the finished house price for the lot or for the teardown. So uh, I don't know what, do some quick math on what teardowns are going for in inside the Beltway these days, but let's say it's a Josh million and a half dollar house, right? million and a half dollar house times 0.35 is 525. So I know uh, if the house is going to sell for 1.5 and I can get it for 525, I know there's room there. Uh, that's a deal that I can wholesale because it's probably going to be worth, you know, closer to 575 to six uh, to a decent infill builder. So just use 35% of whatever the finished newly built house prices are in that neighborhood and start with that. That will leave you some room uh, on a well, teardown. Good question, Barry. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so however it is you're coming up with that number, whatever it is, you make your offer uh, and say, all right, um, I can buy it as is. I can uh, pay cash, close in a couple of weeks, no inspections, no appraisals, uh, no nonsense. Uh, my number to do that uh, today is 450000 Next one to speak, loser. And there you go. Right. If you just wait long enough, you'll either get two things. They'll respond, they'll say something, or they'll hang up. If they hung up, they weren't motivated, right? Uh, but if they respond at all, you know there's at least some motivation. If you throw out a number, $150,000 below whatever you got out of them, and they don't hang up, they're probably at least a little motivated, right? Uh, but we can hung up on a lot, uh, and that's okay, too. Uh, unless the number they gave me was already, I know, a really good, clearly motivated number, uh, then I don't necessarily have to try to take another 150 grand out of it. But more often than not, we're we're six figures apart uh, from where they typically want to be with their wish number uh, based on the Zestimate or what the neighbor across the street sold for or whatever. So my price to, to buy that house, Mr. Seller, would be 450000 well, the one across the street sold for 550 or, you know, my loan, I owe more than that, or I got to at least get, you know, 500. You're probably going to at least get some really good uh, anchoring information on what they really want on the other side as a response, right? Uh, so don't be afraid to throw out some what you feel like is an uncomfortably low number. If you don't feel uncomfortable, at least a little bit saying it, or if you're not I'm expecting to possibly be hung up on. It's probably not low enough, right? Uh, we the, point, the point being is that these houses, the majority, the majority of them require in a, a, like a lot of work and people don't realize all the fees and costs associated with all the work that's associated with it. And so, um, you know, home, home sellers don't know, right? That you, you they don't understand the cost. They think that a kitchen might only cost fifteen thousand. Really, that kitchen's thirty thousand dollars, right? So, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you are um, protecting yourself in that process and um, and setting yourself up. By the way, many investors here over the last year have been overpaying for deals. Overpaying. It's not like I, I don't even understand like why they've been spending so much money. I think this market is going to bring a lot of reality to people. Um, and, and, and so you just gotta be, just gotta be careful in this process. Um, Paul has a question. 
Back in February, the Kaiser Group sent out an email referring to the Renovate Now Pay Later program. Are you still offering this program to sellers? Can you talk about it briefly at a high level? The answer is yes. Uh, we are um, in the middle of several projects like that. Um, the way it works is that if I'm listing the property, right, and Mark is doing the construction work, I know I have a known person that I like, trust, respect doing that work that we, and, and he knows that he's got a listing agent that is going to do all the right things, price it at the right number, do the right marketing, that we will lend that seller the money, essentially, to upgrade the property so that they can maximize the sale for the asset. See, many times I'll enter into, you know, like one of the things that I believe in is full transparency, right? When I walk in, I'm negotiating with the seller. I'm like, seller, there's a number, there's a, an investor number that's out there, a number that I'm willing to buy the property for. And that number more than likely is too low for you, right? Uh, but that is a, somebody comes in, they buy a cash, they can close at whatever time frame suits you and works for you. And it is a solution, right? And by the way, if you like the idea of that solution, I can give you an offer or I can gather two or three other offers from me completely off market to get you a number. Then there's what's what I call polishing the penny number and putting it on the open market and maybe just putting a couple thousand dollars or cleaning it out. Maybe it's a hoarder situation. And really, instead of leaving all the stuff in the house, we just take it all out. It might cost four or five thousand dollars to take it all out. But by taking that four or five thousand, um, like spending that money, they're going to get another 40,000 because now people can actually walk through it. Or there's the renovate the completely renovate the property, bring it up to what I would call market value, right? Market ready based on other comps, not over improving. And that's when we, we tell them if, if you're willing to go through that process and that will take 20 to 30 days, you will get the maximum value for your house. We will take on that cost and we'll just get paid back at settlement. And so it's a way for the seller to be able to get maximum value for their home without poning up the money on the front end. So it was a way for us to solve that problem for them. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, the majority of people take us up on that, right? If they don't have yeah. the funds. Um, but there are some people that just don't want to go through that process emotionally. Yeah. They don't want to wait 30 days. The thought of even just having to pay that money on the back end isn't appealing. So it's like, no, I just want a, a, an offer that solves my problem and we can settle quickly. That That's more appealing to me. Great. I've given them all the options. I've been completely transparent. Mm -hmm. And that makes me feel warm and fuzzy at night. And I've helped that seller move forward in their life. And, so and you offered them options, right? You've had yeah. options for them. Uh, which is always better than a take it or leave it or a yes or no, right? Which one of these options works best for you? Uh, because you want to have a way uh, to make something out of this opportunity. A person has called you that wants to sell a house, right? Uh, that is an incredible opportunity. You should be able to monetize that one way or another. We say never leave a lead on the table. If they say, you know, my, my best number I'm going to save this house for is 600, and you know that you know, the ARV of the house in great shape is 650, say, well, okay, it sounds like maybe my solution isn't for you because you don't need uh, what I would offer in the way of an investor buying the house for a full renovation. Why don't you fix it up a little bit and try to get it shined up to that 650 level? I know who you should be talking to about that. I know one of the best agents in the area. He's got a program where that house can get fixed up and you might not even have to pay for it until it sells. Um, how about if I have them follow up with you? And almost everyone would say, sure. Have them give me a call. They never turn it down. Uh, yeah. They gave it a shot. They tried the guy from the postcard to see if they could get their 600 in two weeks cash, probably knowing it wasn't going to work that way. Um, but if what they really need is a good agent and what if they really need is the house just cleaned up a little bit, then offer them that. Um, they want to sell the house. So don't just say, well, 450 is my number. If you don't like it, good luck. Uh, do something with it. Barry yep. said, can you offer a deal to investors who bring you people interested in the Rehab Now Pay Later program? Barry, 
we are always open to to doing deals, right? So bring us something and and we are always open to being creative and helping people figure out a win-win solution. So the answer is yes. We'll figure yeah. it out. We'll right? figure it out. Absolutely. It out. Absolutely. Uh, but have that have that option. Uh, and it comes from being empathetic and wanting to solve a problem and hopefully having some other options that may not be you, but if you refer business to someone else, wouldn't they probably be willing to pay you something for helping them get some business for whatever it is uh, yep. as an agent, contractor, whatever. Um, so <clears throat> let's say you get a decent response uh, from your offer. Like, oh, the best I can can do, uh, uh, Mr. Seller, is 450. Oh, I, I can't sell it 450. I got to have at least 475. Well, that's pretty good. That's close enough, right? So when you know you're on the same planet, then you want to try to set an appointment where you can get your contract signed. Now, bringing up our new virtual world, um, I think we're going to try to set up where we don't necessarily have to even meet uh, with a seller. I need to go and actually get in the house. So now that it sounds like we're maybe on the same planet, me or my contractor, I'm going to send somebody out to the house, just kind of reconfirm some of the things that we talked about. But if everything looks good, I can email you an offer that you can sign electronically. And then the title company will follow up with you and get you paid in a couple of weeks. Where do I send the offer to? Uh, you can do it that way. The traditional way, though, is get them to the house so that they can actually sign a contract. Uh, we'll, we'll see you know, what we end up doing more of uh, going forward. But minimally, you do need to get to the house at some point uh, and check it out. Uh, if the seller is around, do you know they, they can be there? Then great. Ask them what time they can be there sooner rather than later. Right. If you know you're within twenty five thousand dollars of what looks like a really good deal on paper, ask them. I can be there at five o'clock tonight. Yeah. What time can you be there? Right. Because they probably are. If they've called you, they're probably getting another postcard. They're probably calling somebody else. So it's speed to lead and empathy, um, probably in equal parts is what's going to get you the deal. We weren't always the first guy in the door. Uh, but I, I think we do a good job of trying to legitimately be helpful uh, and being empathetic and not just reading from a script, not just you know doing a, a fill in the blank, uh, but trying to understand what people's problems are, trying to find out if we have a solution for it and offering the solution. Do that, be likable, and, and you'll get a deal. Uh, but try to meet the people uh, at the house, ask them if they have everything they need, if it's like an estate property, do they have their power of attorney? Have they already processed their probate? Uh, if they don't know what any of that means, great. There's a problem you can help solve. Sounds like you probably need to talk to a really good estate attorney. Here's one of my favorites. How about I put you in touch with them? Um, now you're helping them get to the process. Control that conversation. Um, Control that conversation. Tara, Tara has a question. Yep. Do you work with realtors on this program too? That's All the time. Yeah. Um, Yep, we definitely can uh, can work with other uh, agents to help their clients uh, get houses renovated to bring them up to top of market uh, standard. Uh, it's obviously what we do for a living already, right? We try to spend the least to get the most. Uh, we can do it for ourselves and we can do it for uh, third party clients just yeah. as well as we do it for ourselves. Tara, for the longest time, Mark only did that internally for us, for, for our team. And uh, it's been recently in the last couple of months that we said, you know what, we should probably open this up because there's a big need and they do such a great job at it. So, uh, so the answer is yes, you can, you can hit Mark up via Facebook, you know, and, and certainly ask him any questions that you have. Uh, Anybody oops. else have any questions? Okay. Mark, we're at an hour and 30, dude. So we got to yeah. like, Get, let's just knock this out, right? We've got, we, don't we have the stream till midnight? No, no, we're going to have dinner. Right. Everybody's going to have so dinner. You're, uh, you're at your appointment, right? So what do you do at your appointment with the seller? How do you handle the seller appointment, Rob? You want to buy the house. What do you say? What, like I'm already there at the house? Yeah. Yep. I'd, I'd say, Mark, thanks so much for welcoming, uh, welcoming, welcoming me into your home. Like, let's, let's take a look around. Let's, let's. Tell me a little bit about the situation, right? And um, you walk around going, oh my God, why does this house smell so bad? No, you know, it's interesting on the listing, like on, on typical listing appointments, I always just go to the kitchen table, right? Mm -hmm. And sit down and have a business discussion um, and, and control that conversation there. I find that when I'm going into a, a true distressed seller's home, sometimes there isn't a kitchen table, right? right. Uh, and um, 
And so we're doing a, a tour of the house. But if there is a kitchen table that's manageable to get to and I can move things. I mean, I've done it where I've like, I've moved things so that we could just sit down and have a, a conversation. And yep. then once we have that conversation, I reiterate what we discussed on the phone. I develop rapport in that process. Then they'll give me a tour around the house and I pass no judgment about anything. And half the time, beat them up. I'm sorry about this. I'm so sorry about that. I'm like, no, like don't, don't apologize. I'm, you know, we, we buy houses that, that require, uh, some, some minor TLC and, and, um, and I'm, I'm happy that we're here and that we're talking. Right. Yeah. So. We don't, we don't beat up the house. Uh, if you know, there's a hole in the roof, you go, hmm, okay, well, how long you been dealing with that? Okay. Well, that's, that sounds like a situation. That's something that may need a little bit of uh, a little bit of work. Uh, and just kind of leave it at that. We, we don't run around aghast uh, at the condition of the house. People already know if they're motivated, they know uh, that the house needs some work and we don't need to rub their, their noses in it, but you do want to see it. So just have them show you around, uh, make your notes, uh, reaffirm what your price is, and then remake your offer or revise your offer, do what you need to do based on what you've seen. All right, I, I, can, I can work with this. Uh, this is the kind of house that I buy. I would love to buy this house. I'm actually looking at a couple of houses uh, right now, but this one really appeals to me. I would love to do the work on this house. My price to do that is 425, whatever the number is. Uh, I can do it in cash. Uh, we can close you in a couple of weeks. You said you needed to close by what, the end of the month? All right, today's the eighth. I think we can probably make that happen. Obviously, the longer you have to close, the more time you have to wholesale your deal, if that's what you're intending to do. Uh, Again, we find most motivated sellers have other things going on where they're not looking to close by this Friday, unless it's like a pre-foreclosure. Uh, most of the time we can get at least a couple of weeks uh, in order to close uh, and then uh, make your offer and say, great, well, I can make this happen today. Here is my contract, it's ready to go. Sign here at the bottom, uh, close the door behind you and you're done, right? You make that pitch, sign here and this is done. Whatever the problem is, sign here and I will go take uh, care of, uh, I don't wanna say take care of your your ex. I will go and deal with your ex. Uh, <laughs> I will uh, go and clean out this house. I'll solve the problem. I will solve the problem, whatever the problem was. Right? Say, we'll get to say like, I'm, I'm looking forward to helping you through this problem and, and solving, it, solving it with you. Doug yeah. has a question, right? Yeah. How can a new wholesaler investor make offers on a property that's, uh, that is on the market specifically when they request proof of funds that you don't have. Can you JV with someone or find a private investor to provide the proof of funds before making an offer? Yep. So, well, a couple of things. Uh, if it's on the market, that's probably when you are most likely going to be asked for your proof of funds, right? Uh, if it's an REO, the bank is selling it, or it's an agent that just happens to be selling a fixer-upper investor special house, uh, if it's an agent, they may say, great, appreciate your offer. Show me your proof of funds for the offer. In that case, then yes, you need to have uh, a funds letter lined up from somewhere. Uh, you should uh, then be in conversations with a lender or a partner or someone that's going to help provide that money. Uh, if you need one of those, let us know. We'll put you in touch with some uh, great people who can get you those uh, pre-approval letters for your deal that say, yep, we've checked this person out. Uh, we've uh, looked at the property with them uh, and subject to a clean contract, we're prepared to fund this deal at X number of dollars. Uh, it's not necessarily cash then, right? If you're getting even a hard money lender from uh, a hard money loan from a lender, we still write them up as cash, right? Rob, I don't, most agents kind of know how it works. Any, any, private money. Curious, any uh, private lenders on, the, on here right now, like you could put your information down, right? And say, I'm a mm -hmm. private lender. I, I'm lending funds like Doug there. There are a lot of people that will JV with you that will lend you money. Uh, the issue is not the money. The issue is finding the deal and the network. This network provides you the conduit to find those people. Um, and heck, if nobody does raise their hand, you just go directly to Mark uh, or I and, and we'll be happy to JV with you. We will be happy to put you in touch with lenders that we've worked with for years uh, that do an amazing job and they will provide you proof of funds. Once you build a trust with them, they'll, 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 you'll have proof of funds and, and you'll be able to show those proof of funds 
to yep. whoever you need to show them to. So now if the house is not on the market, someone just responded to your marketing or you went to a pre foreclosure and knocked on the door and said, Hey, I can help. Uh, and they're like, okay, that sounds great. If you can buy the house for that amount of money and stop this foreclosure auction, great, buy the house. Chances are good. You're not going to get asked for proof of funds. Rob, when was the last time anybody asked you as a, a really motivated seller to, to provide a bank statement? Never. It's never happened. I've never, never been asked for a bank statement. Uh, we they, figure you're there, <laughs> they figure if you're there, you got, you got the funds right. to make it happen. That's right. Uh, confidence has a lot to do with everything. You're here to solve a problem. You can solve the problem. You will solve the problem. Everything else is details. Uh, don't don't get bogged down yeah. with the details because they will. Uh, they, they don't want to get bogged down with the details. They want their problem solved. Yeah. So focus on that and move on. Uh, so speaking of moving on. on. What's yeah. the next slide? Let's move on. That's right. That's what I was, I was trying to do. Drop the uh, drop the the question oh, bar there real quick. Okay. Uh, because there are a couple other really quick points to make. So uh, while you're at the house, you're making your deal. They're going to sign up. Say, great. Uh, is it all right if I put a lockbox on the house? Uh, I may need to have a contractor come back and work on plans, get ready for permits, uh, get ready to make submissions to the county. Uh, I might even need to have one of my partners come by real quick uh, to look at it uh, before we get to closing. Uh, is it all right if I put a lockbox on the house and have somebody come by uh, maybe once or twice? Again, as a wholesaler, that is your opportunity to get a lockbox on the house and possibly go back with your potential wholesale buyer uh, and get the house sold to another buyer that may want to check out the house. Or uh, we've had success as wholesalers and you just explain, hey, uh, my job in this uh, is to go to one of the couple dozen guys that I know who are always buying in this neighborhood. I'm going to show them this house. Uh, they're going to uh, make this deal and close on it. Uh, but I just need one Saturday to bring them all out and show them real quick. Uh, if we can line that up, how about Saturday 12 to 2? Uh, once I get through that process, then we'll put the final dots on the I's and crosses on the T's and we'll be done. And again, a motivated seller is fine with that. They just want the problem solved and the house sold. If you tell them you need two hours next Saturday to show your partners this house and pick which one you want to work with to go to closing, they'll be okay with that. Uh, so that's the part about explaining that your partner may be at closing. We actually don't even do that anymore because we don't make our sellers go to closing, right? We close remote. Uh, title company goes to them. We say, where do you want to be? Now with uh, everything that's going on, we're going to see more and more of these just remote remote closings, e-closings. Yep. 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 So uh, the point about uh, knowing a motivated seller when you hear one, right? Seller psychology. Uh Negative selling works with a truly motivated seller. Uh, it actually sounds like a, a pretty nice house, Mr. Smith. Why are you needing to sell it again? Uh, and they'll sell you, right? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, you know, it's got a crack in the foundation or, you know. Well, I would typically, yeah, I would typically. Say Carol Baskins is trying to uh, drive me into bankruptcy and I got to I got to sell this thing. You know, I would say, hey, it sounds like a beautiful home. Why why aren't you listing this uh, on the open market with a, a competent real estate agent? Right. I mean, you uh, learn a lot with that one question, by the way. Yep. Yeah. Try the takeaway, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the, the never split the difference uh, method of seller psychology is, well, uh, how can I do that, right? That's right. Uh, I, I need to get to five. So, well, how can I do that? Uh, we talked about what the house needs. Uh, and I'm willing to do that. I enjoy doing that. I like the process of renovating. I'll bring in the electrician to do electrical work. I'll bring in the plumber. We'll probably knock down some walls and open things up and renovate the kitchen. Uh, that does take a little time, costs a good bit of money, and it requires a little bit of risk. Uh, and we need to be compensated for that. And that's why my price is what it is. You know, uh, what's, what's so interesting about that, Mark, there's um, years ago, I, um, I took Sandler sales training. If anybody's ever taken Sandler sales training, it's a tech sales training. It was geared. Actually, I don't know if it was geared towards tech, um, but I took it in in the tech environment and they call that the hot potato. So yeah. the, how, how would you, how, how would you expect me to do that? That That's like, you throw it back. It's the hot potato. You're putting it back into their court. Right. Right. And uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to read, that's an old book written by David Sandler called, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. Um, guys, this this business is a is a it's a people business, it's a marketing business, and it's a sales business. So you need to make sure that you rapport, understand people, and develop rapport. 
you need to understand how to create great marketing to get people to to call and then and then you need to understand how to get out of your own way right and use seller psychology uh to to be able to move things forward to help people move forward uh mm -hmm. because there's so many people that i see just they you know they get in the door they have the car and then they they I don't even want to use the word sell. They just get in their own way. And so they don't know how to take it to the next logical step. And they they lose tens of thousands of dollars by by not being able to offer the solution that they they could they could offer. Because they said the wrong thing at the wrong time, did the wrong thing and and uh, and offended people along the way. Like disaster. So Yep. Yep. Uh practice. You just you just have to practice and practice being attuned to what a truly motivated seller sounds like uh, and what they'll give you in the way of information and the clues that they'll give you uh, to know that uh, this is someone worth following up with this is a problem i can solve and on the other side when when they're not truly motivated sooner rather than later realize that so you can offer the other solution all right this sounds like you probably don't need to sell it to someone like me they'll either do one of two things. They'll say, well, actually, no, I do need to, I need to close by next Friday. Oh, well, if you need to close by next Friday, I can do that. My price to do that is 425. Um, or they'll say, well, all right, well, thanks. They say, yeah, but uh, and, like what you do need, and what you do need is someone to help you get maximum value for this house. How about if I have my buddy Rob call you? He is the best agent in Northern Virginia. He's got guys that can get this house fixed up for you. Much cheaper and faster and easier than you might imagine and get you highest uh, value for the house. Would that be all right? Offer the better solution for them in the first five minutes of the conversation, not in the last hour and a half of the conversation, and certainly not after you've driven all the way out to the house. Find a way to get comfortable asking the questions that you need to ask to determine real seller motivation before spending too much of your time with someone that you can't help. Yep. We're looking in front of people that we can help. Uh, and so that's what that's what all of these strategies are for is getting in front of people that you can help. Lord has had a question. And Mark, how many more slides do you have? I think we're done, That's right? It. That's okay, it. great. We're done. Took an hour and 43 minutes to go through all those slides. Guys, thanks for, for sticking with us this whole time. Uh, Lourdes, you're a brave soul, girl. I love it. Thank you for, for being on here. I want to answer your question. How do you handle the time constraints a seller in deep water might have? I assume you, you mean time constraints like a a foreclosure, a looming auction date? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean, uh, what, what specifically do you mean by the time constraints? I could be more specific. I, I think I understand what you mean, mean but I want to I want to make sure that I answer your question correctly. And by the way, if any of you have, we're going to open the floor with, for, for additional questions. And again, uh, you guys can network with each other on here. Um, Put it put in the chat box, like if you have a question or if you've got money to lend or if you're a wholesaler, if you got a deal, we'll put it on the screen and we'll make sure that everybody sees it. Um, so Lourdes, was there anything specific or I'll, I guess I could just answer? I, I think let's assume, cause she's saying in deep water. So yeah, yeah. yes, they have to sell ASAP. So let's assume it's pre foreclosure. What do you do? Yeah, they have to sell ASAP, right? Yeah. Um, well, it depends on like, the time frame if they've got if i've got 20 days before that auction date and there's equity in that property i can make them understand how time is no longer on our side and that we need to expedite it in a loving way mm -hmm. and um and i get that property on the open market as quickly as i possibly can and i i i either do the as is like if we, we either buy it, we do the as is on the open market and I get people to bid, I got to price it accordingly. Or, you know, typically the reno work, we're not going to do any kind of renovation because time's not on our side, but we'll clean it up. We'll polish the penny. And my job is to try to get a contract within, you know, the first three or four or five days, which is totally doable, right? In this market, even in this market right now, even with Corona and everything that's going on. If you price it right for its condition, location, and time of the year, it will get a contract. And and then I'm going to take that contract and I'm going to talk to the buyers and see if we can get it settled before that auction date. And if we can't, I'm going to try to go directly to the bank. I'm going to go directly to the bank and I'm going to buy us more time. And if they're not going to give us more time, 
And I see that the only option for them is, is for us to figure out, and this is a last case scenario, for them to go file at the courthouse, right, to, to just stop the foreclosure, which they could do themselves uh, by filing bankruptcy, which I, I don't you know advise people to do, but the, it's an option for them to do. They can stop that foreclosure and we can continue with the settlement to get it all done. And then, by the way, you know, if they don't have to follow through with the bankruptcy, and that's a whole nother class and discussion, it gets lifted after 15, 20 days. And then and then it would just go right back into um, that foreclosure process. But you've bought yourself some time. Typically, that strategy will allow us to buy time so that we can get that property sold. We'll either do it uh, if the property has equity and try and get and we will put it on the market to get them their equity or even if it there is no equity in the property that buys us time to start doing the short sale to get a contract to then take it to the bank to negotiate the deal and okay. so um you know speed it's all about understanding the different things you need to do and then moving quickly on them but in most cases 10 days is enough to get the house sold right yes, 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 yes. 20 days is enough time to get the house marketed to somebody else as an agent and still get it sold yeah uh, if you're less than you know seven days then maybe you're talking about knowing some other creative ways to to stop a foreclosure uh good shout good out to Jay. thank you for saying that appreciate it yeah absolutely uh but yeah we don't we don't get super creative at anything uh over 10 days. 10 days is usually enough time to buy a house if you need to. Yeah. And then sometimes what will happen is you'll pull the title and there'll be all sorts of nasty little, like, you know, weird liens and things like that. And, yep. you know, you've got to buy more time. So, right. Guys, this is the first time, right, that we've ever done this through this platform. So, this is us learning how to do this. So, thank you for sticking with us this whole time. Um, you know, I'm missing everybody's faces. Like maybe next time we'll, we'll test the next one. Maybe with, uh, uh, Zoom. we'll do the zoom teams or something like that. Although I enjoyed like watching everybody's comments and putting them on here. Um, but if you enjoyed any of this, please review us online RSVP for next month's meeting. Uh, do me a favor, connect with people here that you might see that they commented uh, in, uh, in the chat, connect with them online, um, connect with them on LinkedIn. Right. And like Mark said, go find deals. Uh, Lourdes, you are more than welcome. Sandra's got a question. I'm wholesaling Innova looking for buyers and partners. Check that out. I'm also looking for a place to house hack. There you go. Sandra, is it house hacking for your own personal residence? Like I love helping people do that. Uh, let's see. What's Barry say here? Barry, my face, but my honey is so much hotter. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's see. Great job. Oh, thanks. Thanks, John. I appreciate you, man. Uh, I love the format. Even if I still miss the real person, contact me. Yes, yes, yes. Me too. I miss that. But hey, you know, this is the new reality for a little while, guys. Try. So next time we're working on lights. I don't know where to set up in the house, a place where the dog doesn't disturb me. I haven't eaten my pizza yet. What's up, Marco? How you doing, buddy? Good to see you, virtually, anyway. Uh, yeah, cool. find us on Facebook. Rob, I shared the Facebook page, if you're seeing the screen share, for those that aren't on our Facebook group for Grid Rested. Okay, I'll do it. Hang on a second. Sandra, uh, send me a private message. Love to help you. Yep. Okay. Uh, Grid Reston. Uh, it's a closed Facebook group, right? So find it under Facebook groups uh, and we'll let you in. Cool. Yep. Okay, people. Thank you so much. Art! What's up, man? Hello, oh, Art. Art. What's going on, man? All right, love to see you on here, man. Uh, yeah, he's doing a ton. We need to uh, get him on one of these Zooms. I know. We need to check out what Art is doing these days. It's been some time, right? Let's see. What did Nico say here? I'm having fun with it. If you need renovations, check out finecraftcontractors.com. Yes, 
We're offering incentives in these difficult times. I love I'm it. Looking for, uh, I'm looking for deck and fence guys. If anybody has a good deck and or fence company. Oh, cool. Uh, looking, looking for those. Looking for always looking for contractors. Uh, if anyone knows of good contractors. Those are little emojis, right? I love them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, guys. Hey, well, thank you for spending your Tuesday night with us. Uh, we appreciate you. We love you. This is, you guys are part of our tribe. As always, we're here to answer questions and just be part of your network. We believe that the power is in the network. And so one of the pieces I know that's missing from this is from you guys to be able to connect with each other. I got to figure out how to do that. Um, but we're, we're going to figure it out, right? As we move forward, we're going to figure this piece out. And Let us know, right? Go on that Facebook page uh, and drop us a line. If you've got something you think works as good or better for networking and getting people kind of chatting in the room. Uh, we're open. All I can tell you is we'll be here first Tuesday next month, right? Uh, we'll be here. Here. Somewhere. Here. here. <laughs> we'll have a different setup. I won't see my V-dub little bus in the back. Uh, we'll be somewhere. We'll be here for you somewhere. <laughs> okay, uh, guys. Make a great night. Take care. Much love. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Be good.